Welcome to Cyber in Five, a LinkedIn live series where we talk to security practitioners and experts and really hit on some key topics that are trending in cybersecurity and really focus on the business impact. So today I'm really excited. We have Mal Munez, who's part of Amazon Web Services, AWS, Principal Technologist, joining us today. So Mal, for question number one, why don't you talk a little bit about what your role is at AWS and how you work with organizations? Hi, Stacy. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, sure. Well, as you mentioned, I am principal technologist. And basically what it means is I, I, I talk with customers around the world about uh, what are their challenges to move critical applications to the cloud. And, and we work together with them and internally with AWS to help and block them to move those critical applications. That's great. And I know in some of our discussions, as we were getting to know each other, we really talked about resiliency and how a lot of the roles that you're driving is how do we drive that cyber resiliency and how should security leaders think about it? Do you want to talk a little bit about cyber resiliency? Yes, sure. Yeah, definitely. Resilience is one of the, is the topic when I spend most of my time talking with customers. And when we talk about cyber resilience, well, the, the thing is, uh, the, the main thing that we like our customers to think is to have the right mindset. And what I mean by the right mindset is approach the resilience problem from the right perspective. And the right perspective is resilience is a business problem. It's not a technology only problem. Uh, but when you have a, an impairment, you have a, an availability issue, the, the business will be affected. So you need to recognize that. And then as when, when you think from the business perspective, resilience is not, is not a, you don't solve the equation for resilience uh, as the most interesting business problems. You really need to think about solve the, solve the equation, solve the problem of a continuous improvement. It's not like you have a one shot. You will have a, a, um, template of infrastructure of code that's going to solve your problem, or you will have a, a set of configurations and then you are done. Resilience is a continuous improvement process. That's, and that's how we need to approach that, that, that problem. When we talk about continuous improvement, that means that you are aiming for perfection, but you know that you are doing incremental increases in your posture. So, Everything is start with a cycle. And, and it, at AWS, what we do, we help us, our customers, we publish documentation. And there's one published what paper in, in AWS public, public site that is called Resilience Lifecycle Framework. That it's basically, we, we talk about this. We talk about how, how to think about resilience as a, as a continuous process. Always starting with the first phase that is defining your goals. And going back, we were talking about business. Um, you define your goals based on how it impacts your business. You define your your uh, objectives. You define you define your your metrics based on that. Then you go to the next phase. You now know what to do. Now you're going to anticipate. We call it anticipate. Is try to think what can go wrong. And there are different methodologies. You go out there. There's there's methodologies like FMEA or STPA. Uh, internally at AWS, and we help our customers in these discussions to implement what we call a, a resilience modeling system-based approach. It's based on how the system is providing value for the business and how can things go wrong from there. And it means it could be lack of availability, but it also could be a delay in a response, for example. So that kind of things. Then you are anticipating, you are, you are trying to think what can go wrong. And with that knowledge, you go and implement, select and implement controls, you implement your controls. But if you go back and you think that this is a continuous improvement, you know that things can go wrong and you need to learn from that. That's the last portion of the cycle. How do you learn? And you learn in practice by, by using a couple of techniques. The first one is, is if something goes wrong and you weren't expected, you need to do a post-mortem. Internally at AWS, we call that a correction of error process. So you go there and, and learn from what, what happened because you don't want a, a good crisis go to waste. You want to learn as much as possible. Like that. so, yeah, that's, that's, that's the way you improve. 
And the second way that you can improve is you can inject things. Like you don't need to wait for something to go wrong. You can inject things and check how, how your, your system function is working. And from there, you go back and you reinforce your learning. So you go back and, and anticipate and select controls and continue the process. Uh, just, just as a final thought, uh, we are talking about resilience as a continuous process, as a business problem. It's not only technology, it's a process, but you cannot forget about people. People is a key element of, of all this process. I really like, Mal, what you just called out, right? The fact that really when you think about resiliency, it has to be an entire business and technology put together. It is that continuous loop of information. And the key there, I think, is always to share the information, right? Making sure the business understands why certain controls are put in place, the security teams understand why the business is trying to operate in a certain way. As long as those conversations are happening with the continuous cycle, that's when I see the best defense strategies really come out as you've highlighted there. Exactly. So thinking about controls, um, and this is actually where as a AWS partner, SecureWorks and AWS often work closely together, but how do you think security leaders should think about what are the right controls to focus on, check, learn? And I love the learn from every crisis and how do you adapt those controls? <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's that's kind of a, a also a mindset that we like to use with, with our customers. So we, we like our, our customers to think your their system function in the timeline, like when you have your system function operating, you have a, a timeline and you have the time, the time where everything is going fine, right? There's no problem that you, your, your application is working. Uh, and if you think that's the time that you want to maximize uh, until you had a failure. So you have, you have that time and conceptually you can think that as mean time between failures. The meantime that your application is working between between failures, uh, conceptually, what you want to do is to maximize that time as much as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Then something happens, right? At that point, when something happens, uh, you have some time until to you can detect things. That's the meantime to detect. And again, this is more conceptual. It's not like a math formula or something is just think that when something happens, you will have some time to detect that something is going on. What you want to do is to reduce that time as much as possible. That's the mean time to detect. And then once you know what's happening, you have another time that is the MTTR. It could be mean time to recover, mean time to respond. It depends on, uh, on the literature. But at the end is how long are you going to take to go to business as usual? And again, you want to reduce that time as much as possible. So if you think uh, in that in that space, in that timeline, you have mean time between failures, you want to be that MTBF as, as long as possible, you think about preventive controls, what you can do to prevent something from happening. And then you focus on those, your, your mindset in that, in that preventive control. Then you think about how to reduce the MTTD. Those are observability controls, what we call observability controls. How you fine tune your controls so you, you know that something is happening even before your customers know, even before AWS know that something is happening. How do you know that, that something is happening with your application? Uh, and then how do you help that observability to help you uh, troubleshoot or identify exactly where is the problem? And then you go into the, into the third part is reduce the MTTR. That's basically what you just mentioned. Uh, we know that something can go wrong and something will go wrong. At that point, we are not considering if it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Now it's happening. How can we reduce the time to recover? What's the kind of activities, the recovery controls that we can use? Uh, and that includes, of course, something like thinking about your disaster uh, disaster recovery strategy to recover from those from those situations. Yeah, I really like how you positioned, right? Thinking about the controls for that preventative, the detection, the response, and then you put that through the life cycle, you now have a true resiliency plan with the right controls that you're constantly guiding. And I think that part of the prevention, and I love the kind of mean time to failure and making that as long as possible, 
I think uh, sometimes the pendulum swings and I've heard different talks. We've seen it in some instances where the pendulum's really heavily swung of, okay, let's make sure we have the response and the recovery. And if something happens, because we know it will happen at some point, but there's so much that organizations can do on the proactive front to prevent things as much as they can. So I like the focus there. Yeah. And that kind of leads into our question number four, right? One of the things that we at SecureWorks spent a lot of time talking to is how do we really help organizations scale out their security program? Because if you're listening today, you might think about, well, this sounds like a lot, but the reality is many organizations have smaller security teams. So when you're thinking about the people and you talked about how important the business and people are, what advice do you give to security leaders to think about how you can execute what sounds maybe on paper or in this virtual world, our conversation, a large task, but there's a lot that people can do and really with a smaller team to make impact, especially when you utilize people in the equation. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, when we have these kind of situations, I think that there are two things that we need to think about. One is culture, as you just mentioned, people is really important. And the second one is automation. When we talk about culture, uh, uh, when we think it's smaller thing, we think that's a, that's a disadvantage. But at some point, that's a really, a, it's, it's, it's an advantage because when you have a small team, you have the sense of ownership. And I think that's that's key when we are talking about resilience. It's not letting letting people think that resilience is it's is other person's job. No, resilience is everyone's job, is our job. And we as a small team, we need to think from resilience from, from the beginning. Like resilience cannot be an afterthought. Okay. That's that's the kind of thing uh uh that we we talk with our customers. There are like the culture of resilience is really important. And you just mentioned. Uh, some minutes ago, an important thing, and it's sharing. Uh, one thing that we have found really, really important is when we have an incident, uh, we need to have a blameless culture. That means let's go, let's find the truth. It's not it's not about pointing fingers, anything like that. We just want to know what happened. Because if something happened, if we can prevent, uh, that's where we improve. And the second thing that we found is once you know something that happened, share, share that information, share with other teams, share with other cells. We call those cells internally two pizza teams. Uh, share that information, have a space, have a mechanism so everybody can share that information with others. So what you learn can help others uh, and the other way around, of course. Um, the second part is, of course, uh, automation. And that's where technology can help us to solve the equation of resilience improvement. Uh, think about automation and how you can automate across the whole life cycle. Uh, of course, you can automate implementing CI/CD pipelines. So you can have your, your non-functional test along with your test during your pipeline when you are doing, and that counts as a preventive control, something that you do before, before something's happening. If you automate that pipeline, you can uh, release some time, free some time for the developers to start thinking in, in your business features instead of, of, of the process of testing. That's one thing. Um, you can also think about uh, automation uh, when you are thinking in observability and the link with recovery controls. Because one thing that you want to do is once you are sure that you know what's the problem, you try to automate the solution. And if you can automate the solution and link that to the alarms that were created by your observability solutions, that now suddenly you have a self-healing service. And then again, we are talking about freeing time for, for, for the developers to work on what matters most, most for the business. So basically culture and automation will be the two things that I will share with our customers. I love that. And Mal, you have so many great sound bites. The blameless culture, I think, is so important, right? If everyone can go in that mindset when an incident does occur or they're not sure what happened, you can achieve a lot more faster with that type of mindset. So I love that sound bite. All right, final question. Um, and this one's a big one, maybe the biggest of the day, Mal, is we're already almost into October here and people are starting to think about next year. So what should you think security leaders should really be thinking about as they begin to plan for the next year? What are some things to keep in mind and be top of mind of? Yeah, that's that's a kind of question we need to start thinking. And, and especially in this part of the year, we are 
budgeting approaching and everything else. I think that uh, if the past two years uh, have, ser have served something is to think how, how artificial intelligence will shape the future in, in every, every field, not only in resilience and security, but in every field. Uh, what I will think uh, and share with, with the customers is think about how artificial intelligence can shape and modify what you are doing now. And, and my suggestion is, we know that Gen AI is a big thing of what's happening, but AI has been here for decades. So don't, don't just think about Gen AI, think about how AI in general can help you. Uh, there, are, there are ways in which AI will change or is changing right now. Like for example, how do you de detect patterns? In your in your logs in your observability uh, assets, so how how can you detect that easier if you have AI, not necessarily generative AI, but also how can you do a better correction of errors? We were talking about blameless culture. Uh, we capture a lot of information during an incident, and then we try to find what's happening there and what was the result. That that's another part when uh, artificial intelligence can help. Uh, and of course, we have all of the domain about detection of anomalies, uh, detection of, of, of patterns. And that's another point where, where AI can help and, and maybe um, extend the, the, the people, like you, you can focus your people in the real big problems and let AI to deal with the more mechanical and, and more, more uh, boring type of problems. I think that's great. And I think what, you know, what I summarize is it's a lot of getting past the hype, right? Generative AI is amazing. We've seen great use cases, but as you point out, machine learning, data science, that's been out there for a while. And definitely the way that we operate, a lot of what AWS has given to the world has allowed for even more adaptations to grow into the AI field, but understanding how to really maximize its potential. I see that as a big topic for 2025. Mm -hmm. Well, Mal, thank you. We made it through all five questions. And I thank for everyone that's joined us today. Um, really appreciate not only joining today, but the partnership that SecureWorks and AWS have. And for anyone that's interested, please do feel free to check out either of our websites. SecureWorks very focused on how we help organizations do a lot of what Mal just spoke about. How do we help organizations see more, detect better, respond faster? And if you're interested in hearing more about the threats or a whole session around how AWS and SecureWorks works together, October 3rd, SecureWorks is hosting a live global threat intelligence summit that you can join in and watch on demand. We'll put a link in. Thank you again, Mal, and thanks for everyone that joined us today. That's a wrap for Cyber in 5. Thank you, Stacey. Bye-bye.